I'd like to take just a moment to say welcome to New Branch Community Church. If this is your first Sunday with us, we welcome you. Please make sure you fill out your Connect cards and pick up a gift on your way out today. We'd also like to welcome those that are joining us online and by phone today. We have several people that do that every week, and we welcome you guys to be with us. Um, I'd like to start today with a question. Um, we're, we're wrapping up a message series today called Unstuck, and the question I have is this, is do you have it? You, you know what I mean by it? <laughs> you know, it, the, the edge, the eye of the tiger, you know what I'm talking about, the, the fire. I, Maria, I kind of sound like I'm in a tin can up here, so I don't know, <laughs> preaching myself under conviction, so just I don't know what to do with that. But do you have it? Do, do you have what it takes, you know, the X Factor? Anybody, anybody watch X Factor? How many people watch X Factor? Anybody? American Idol? The Voice? Okay, we got some people. Anybody don't know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Welcome to America. I mean, <laughs> really? Seriously? <laughs> anyway, okay, well, I'll give you the premise. Uh, in fact, this guy, here, here's one of the guys. Anybody recognize this guy? Have you got it, Simon Cow? You know, you know, you get the idea. They got judges, and, they're, and it's basically, a, it's basically, they're looking for somebody that can be a star. And the question they have to ask themselves is, "Do you have the X factor? Meaning, are you a star? Do you have it?" And, and can I tell you what the interesting thing about these shows is? They people come from all over the country, millions of people audition, and and they try to find the person that's the most talented that could be a pop star. You, you know, what I'm, you know what I'm talking about. And. Uh, and, and a lot of them, there's like one that has it. That's what they end up with is one. And everybody else doesn't have it. Have you, have you met the ones that don't? Have you ever seen those? And they think they do? Have you, <laughs> have you seen that part? And it's like, really? And, and, you know, and even Simon, he'll look at them and he'll go, did you think that sounded good? Yeah, I have what it takes. I have it. You get it? <laughs> Delusional, isn't it? So, so let, me, let me flip the, the, the tables and ask you a question today. Do you have it, right? Do you have it? it because I, I have a feeling that if you ask your friends, what would they say? Hmm? But th that, that might be an interesting question. That's just fun to ask. The real question is this, does God think you have it? If you're following Christ today, and I've got to tell you about today's message before we get into it, this is for Christ followers. If, you, if, you, if you're not following Christ today, we'd like to invite you to do that. This is a great opportunity for you to sit back and see what it means to be a, a, a believer or a follower of Christ. Um, and, and, and I have a feeling you might be surprised because you might think that it's certain things that it's not. And when you find out this, you may just want to be a Christ follower. But for those of us that are, this is going to be a tough one. In fact, I think it's the right place to end this series unstuck. Because, but, the, but the problem is, is this, is as we read this passage we're about to read, you're gonna, a lot of us are going to say, I've heard that before. Oh, yeah, I know where this is going. And, and I can tell you, the people that he taught it to didn't get it. At, 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 when, when he got finished teaching them this day, they didn't get it. Now, they got it later. And I got a feeling a lot of us, in fact, I'll take, it, I'll take it to another extreme, just so you know how serious I am about this. A majority of us don't get it. We don't get it. We don't get what he's saying here. Some of us have had it before, and now we don't. I'm not talking about salvation. But what he's talking about in this passage, and I have a feeling it's the reason why we're stuck. We know we're stuck, but we don't quite know why. And i got a feeling if this might be it. I have a feeling why it's the reason why a lot of our churches, including this one, could be stuck. So if you want to get unstuck, this is worth following. Today we're going to take a look at John chapter 13. And so if you want to pull out your Bibles and, and turn in them, or if you have a Bible app, you can do that. We highly recommend those, you version. If you don't have that, download that on your phone. It's incredible. And then we've given you an outline, and if you've noticed, I've kind of changed up the outline a little bit to only have the verse, and then you can write whatever you want, because this is not going to be, and life isn't really a one, two, three, and that's how it works. And <laughs> so what we'd like you to do with that outline is, is don't just throw it away. <laughs> um, circle, underline things that you see in the passage, and then not only that, but write some notes. What is God saying to you? Write these things down, and then take it, punch holes in it, and put it in a notebook. That's why we give you a full page. You might not have known that, so I just wanted to explain why we do that. Um, so here we go. John chapter 13, I'd like to set it up before we read it. This was an incredible week for the apostles. I, I don't know if you know this week that we're talking about here. This was a Thursday. It was Passover. It was time for the Passover. But before they had the Passover, they had had an incredible week. Jesus had just come from healing Lazarus, or actually not healing him, he, wrote, he, he resurrected Lazarus from the dead. Now that's an incredible miracle, isn't it? <laughs> 
People are excited when somebody is actually in the grave. We're not talking about somebody in just kind of a, a, a sleight of hand. This guy had been in the grave, and they had seen Lazarus die, and he raised him from the dead. And, and there was a lot of buzz about Jesus after that. You can believe it. And as Jesus comes to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, on, he, he came on a Sunday, and this day was going to be on a Thursday. Um, the people kind of thought, he might be Messiah. And so they started to celebrate him in a way that they had never done before. He came in on a donkey, and they, and they were celebrating him, and they were singing Hosanna in the highest as he comes into the city. And they don't know what he's going to do. They don't realize he's coming to die on the cross. They think he's coming to throw out the Roman Empire, so they're all excited. The king is here. It's probably him. He's done a lot of these miracles. It's amazing. And so here he comes, and the first place he goes, and you're going to appreciate this. How many think, you don't, don't raise your hand. How, how, one of the main reasons why people don't go to church is, is what? Church is all about money. Isn't that right? And you know what the first thing Jesus does? It's nice to know they, they struggled with this in 2,000 years ago. The first place he went was to the temple, and he threw out the money changers. Have you seen that part? That's where he went. He went straight there, and he said, You have made my father's house into a den of thieves. And he turned over the tables, and he went in like a madman and, and drove them out of the temple. <laughs> it makes you wonder what he would do today, doesn't it? In some of our churches, how we handle our finances. If he was here today, would he be turning over our tables and throwing us out? And hmm, that's a whole another message, isn't it? <laughs> um, and then he started to heal. He healed people that week. He he taught that week. He taught some incredible lessons right there in the temple courts. Incredible. And then the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious people, came to ask him questions. I love this part. Now, they didn't ask questions because they wanted to know the answer. They, they, were, they were basically coming up. Have you ever seen these guys that come up with, we want to stump the chump? You get the idea? So we know we got, oh, we got a good one for you. You can't answer this question, Jesus. And, and he did. He answered both of their questions, and they were amazed. And then it said, my favorite words in the Bible was, he said, and they dared not ask him any other questions. <laughs> they went away, and that's when they decided we were going to kill him because we're, there's no more logic here. That's what happens to people, right? They get violent after they realize we can no longer negotiate, we can no longer talk, we can't get through to you, we can't out-argue you, so we're going to kill you. You get it? That was the idea with them. And so they left. And Jesus, on Thursday, decided, I'm going to spend a moment after this busy, incredible week. And it was an incredible week to be a Jesus follower, okay? <laughs> if you were one of the disciples, this was your week of stardom. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, they might not have known you before, but you walked into the city right behind him, and it's like, hey, guys, it's us. It's us. We're in his entourage, and they want to know you because they know him. You get the idea? So it was a very great time to be a Jesus follower. And now they're going to have this meal with just Jesus, the, the Passover meal. For them, Passover was a huge time. It's, it's when they exodus out of, out of Egypt. And so they came together to celebrate Passover, and they were excited. And that's where we pick up in, in chapter 13. It says this. It was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave the world. And go to his father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And the evening meal was in progress, and, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. You see, while it was Passover, it was an incredible time for them, because they're celebrating hundreds of years before when, when Moses brought them out of the land of Egypt into the promised land. The death angel passed over them. That's why it's called Passover. And they had an incredible meal laid out, which is called the Seder meal, and each piece represented a thing. It's an incredible imagery that was there. But Jesus knew before they took this meal together, he knew this was their last, last time before he was going to die. He knew tomorrow, the next day was Good Friday, where he was going to die. They didn't know that. <laughs> they thought it was a party. They thought, hey, this is great. Everybody loves him. But they didn't know that. Have you ever had that time where it was like you had a moment with somebody and it was the last conversation you ever had with them, but you didn't know it and they did? This is that kind of conversation. And he's thinking in his mind, and it's very important to pay attention to because these are the last times that he spent with his apostles. These moments were incredible. And I'll tell you, they didn't get it until later. And here's what he did before they had this pivotal meal where he was going to institute the Lord's Supper. You all know that, right, where, where we have the broken body and shed blood. This is where he did it. At the Seder meal, he pulled off some of the elements and he said, let me change these elements. Instead of it just being the Seder meal, now I want you to celebrate my broken body and shed blood. And they did not get that. But before he had this meal, he did something that's so easy to miss. Verse 4, 
So he got up from the meal and he took off his outer clothing and he wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that he had wrapped around him. Now, even in our day, we can get this. Um, the, people that, the person that washes feet, <laughs> they, they're the low man on the totem pole, right? I mean, <laughs> come on. And in those days, their feet were nasty. You know what I mean? They were lived in a desert environment where they wore sandals, and they walked around the desert all day. So when they got ready to eat a meal, there was two things that were very important. They wanted to be clean, and they wanted to be ceremonially clean, which is important to them. And so they would have a slave wash their feet, because this is a very class society here. I mean, they had slaves. The Romans understood that. You, <laughs> there's people that do this, and there's people that do this. And if you're a leader, you don't do that. You know what I mean? It's even taught. You don't do that. I mean, we kind of get that, right? I mean, don't you get it? I mean, we have CEOs. Where do they sit, right? It, it's taught to you. I mean, I know, because if you're in business, it's very important. You better have some leadership. You better sit down. You better lead this conversation. That's where Jesus was. So it was odd for them to see him wash feet. Now, I know we can't get the image of nasty feet, right? Do we? Wait a minute. Yeah, it would be much like this audience right here. If we, if we were to, <laughs> I've seen some of your feet, you wear flip-flops, I get it, you know? <laughs> and if we were going to wash feet, you kind of get the idea. But I got to tell you something about this, because we've had public foot washings, and I thought about doing that, and, and it's kind of uncomfortable. But, you know, to get up here and you wash somebody's feet, and, it, and it's kind of a cool thing to do. And I'm not putting it down, I get it, I've seen the power of it. But let me explain what this was not. This was not a public display that Christ was doing. He, he was doing something that was normal for them. He did, it wasn't like, why are you washing my feet? Nobody's ever done that. You know, that's what it's kind of like for us, because like, we don't do that. We wear shoes and we, you know, stuff like that. But for them, this was normal. You get it? And, and, and here he comes around doing that. And it's very important to remember that it wasn't just a public display. It was something that was normally done. Now, it got attention because it was who was doing it. You, you get it? And, and they thought it was weird. See? Verse 6. He came to Simon Peter... And said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? <laughs> and Jesus replied, you do not realize what I am doing, but later you will understand. You, you see, he was starting to point out, I, I understand you guys aren't going to get this, but you will later. <laughs> and then Peter speaks up. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. <laughs> you got to love Peter, right? He's constantly correcting Jesus. <laughs> Can you imagine that? I mean, it's just silly, isn't it? I mean, it's just dumb. But, but, but we understand why he said that, because for him, he's going, Jesus, we just had this big moment. You just came in as the king of kings. You just came through the city like this. You don't wash feet, Jesus. You get it? He's saying, you got to understand your position. That's not you. You don't do that. We do that. And we have a pecking order. Anybody, anybody understand what I'm talking about? When we walk in the room, we have a pecking order here. And the lowest guy washes the feet. That's what he's telling him. He understands it. We understand it. We get it. And then Jesus answered him, and, I, and, I, and I'd like you to underline this, because this is a huge part of this passage. Unless I wash your feet, you have no part with me. Whew. That got his attention. He, he corrected him pretty bold, didn't he? He said, let me explain something to you. If I don't wash your feet, you have no part. And this is a side note. In fact, I believe this, this probably is a whole other message, but it's worth pointing out. Because what I see, what Jesus is teaching, and he does it again and again and again, and I think it's important to us today to get this part, is that, that you get where he's going with the washing the feet thing. He's talking about serving people, right? But he's washing the feet, and you have to accept it. And the reason why I'm saying that is, is because there's a ton of people that struggle with this. They struggle on one side or the other. You can serve me, and I get all the service, and I do nothing for anybody else. I've seen some people like that. Don't look at them. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. And then there's other people, and I have a feeling that the majority of us struggle with this one, and I've seen this the most, is that I serve other people, but nobody serves me. You get the idea? Oh, I don't know. You don't watch me. Just like Peter. I could hear these very words coming out of a bunch of people that we know right here in this room. Oh, no, you don't wash my feet. Oh, no, no, no. I don't need you to, do, I don't need you to help me with that. I take care of other people. I don't get help from people. And I need to be very clear when we say this. If that's your attitude, you don't get it. Okay? You don't. You, you can't properly serve until you understand how to allow the people to serve you. When you have a need, it's very clear in Acts chapter 2. Go back and read it. Where one person had a need, the other person met it. But they can't meet it if people are constantly going, no. 
And Jesus is saying, it, I didn't say this, he did. He said, if, if you don't let people do that, if you don't let people serve you sometimes, you have no part. Not, not because he's being harsh, because he's saying, you're not in fellowship. You think you're a guru up here ministering down to the little people. This is clear is what he's saying. It's very crystal clear in my mind. This is exactly where he's going. If you think you're up here and you do all the ministering down, you have no part in this. You don't have it, trust me. <laughs> and I got a feeling some of us are struggling right there. And sometimes the most spiritual thing you'll ever do is let other people help you. It'll build more relationships than you can ever imagine. Verse 9. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet, and their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him. That is why he said, not everyone was clean. Okay. <laughs> Peter always goes to the extreme, doesn't he? All right, then, then give me a whole bath. And Jesus is like, oh, good night, Peter, please. <laughs> no, just your feet. You get that? No, take your own bath. Dude, I'm just washing your feet. You get it? But Peter got it. You, know, you see what he said? No, 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 I'm not, not wanting to submit to you. I just didn't get where this was going. You get it? And that was kind of that whole premise. And then he, then he did this. When, when he had finished, verse 12, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and he returned to his place. In this verse, is, I, I want you to see this part. Put this up on the screen. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked him. Do you understand what I have done for you? Can I tell you? No, they didn't. It's rhetorical. It, it, this is emphasis. This is going, I just did this for you, and you don't get it. And the reason I know for all certainty they didn't get it was because of what followed after the Lord's Supper. They had this big meal, and it's the last supper with Jesus and all this kind of stuff. One last meal, real important moment. And after the meal, we're going to skip to the end, okay? Just, I'm just telling you so there's hope for us. Luke chapter 22, you can look it up or you can go back or write it down. You might need this verse. Here's how we know they didn't get it. Because right after the Lord's Supper, here's what they did. A dispute also arose among them to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Oh, that's good. Right after he washed their feet, right after he explained the cross, right after all of this, then they started going, oh, you're dying? Okay, I don't really get that. Okay, now let me ask you a question. Who's going to be the greatest? Who has the X factor? Who's going to, who has it? You get it? I do, and I'm going to be at his right hand, and I'm going to be at his left hand. No, 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 you're not going to be at his left hand. I'm going to be at his right hand. You get the idea? And this is what they were talking about. And he's going, Seriously? That's why he said what he just said in the passage before. It was kind of like a, a precursor to go, do you understand what I just said? You're all going like this. Do your head. Mm -hmm. Yep. Got you, Jesus. Yep. Understand everything you're teaching. Yep. 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 Been there, done that, got the t-shirt, get it. Can I tell you why I'm going on and on about this? Because I see a bunch of church people going, mm-hmm. Yep. Get it. Can I tell you? Mm -mm. We don't get it. We don't get, a majority of us, when I say a majority, 95% of us don't get this. That's harsh, isn't it? And you're sitting there going, what? Who do you think you are? I'm, I'm saying, sometimes I don't get it. So, sometimes this past week, I don't get it. It's important, guys. He went on to say this in, in Luke. It's, for, it's so important what he said. And I think it speaks to us huge. Jesus said to them after they were doing this, I'm the greatest thing. <laughs> the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. You see? The kings of the Gentiles understand their position and they lord it over them. You've seen it in the Roman times, right? They are Caesar. You will do what they say and they will build their kingdom on your back. You get it? They get it. They lord it over them. And those who exercise authority over them call themselves, you'll like this, benefactors. Isn't this nice? They are way up here. Hello, little people. Let me toss out. You know how the, you know how the Caesars would come in? Throwing money at them. Hey, hello. We can't imagine that in a church, can we? Titles? Bishop? Apostles? <laughs> Today? Pastors? Fathers? And we come in to these small little countries and we, hey guys, 
It's big America. You get it? Money, money, money. We're benefactors. We're way up here. You get it? That's how we wash feet. You get it? We're benefactors. And you know what he said? I want you to point it out in verse 26. But you are not to be like that. Is that bold enough? You are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest. And the one who rules like the one who serves. Good night. <laughs> Go back and read that passage. Now we're going to come back to John. I just want to make sure you were clear on where we're going. I just wanted you to see they didn't get it, and some of us are struggling with it as well. John chapter 13, verse 13. We're coming back to the regular story. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Here, here's a verse to underline, guys. In fact, we'll put it up on the screen. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. You will be blessed if you do them. You will be cursed if you don't. You get it? That's the implication. This is what you need to do. You know what you need to do now, and if you don't do it, let me tell you a couple things I see here. The first thing is this. This is Jesus teaching leadership 101. It is. You want to know what it takes to be a leader? Before we have this meal, before, you, before I leave this place and I institute the greatest movement, because it's not an organization, the greatest movement this world has ever seen is about to come to pass in just 50 days. Maybe you didn't realize it was that fast. <laughs> and you guys don't get it. And I'm about to teach you leadership 51 days. Leadership 101 I'm sorry, I can't count. After he rose from the dead, so it was four days, three days, I can't count, okay? 50-ish 50, 50 days. <laughs> I'm going to institute, the, you guys, I'm not going to be with you, are going to institute the greatest movement this world has ever seen, and I'm leaving it in your hands, and here's how I want you to understand leadership. You get it? Leadership starts with service. Okay, got it. No, you don't. Leadership starts with service. And if you don't get it, you don't understand my kingdom. It is an upside-down kingdom. Those that want to lead, those that are going to be first will be last. And those that are last will be first. What are you talking about? You know, it's, it's confusing. But he's saying it's an upside-down kingdom. If you want to really lead, and, I, and, and in another passage in the Bible it says that those that want to lead, it's a noble thing to want to lead. Those that want to teach, it's, a, it's an incredible gift to be able to teach. But he also says you will be judged more strictly. So be careful with that. But he's saying it's an upside-down kingdom. So if you want to be a leader, you've got to be a servant first. <laughs> the second thing I see here is this. Jesus commanded it. Jesus commanded them to serve. This was an imperative. Do you get it? This was not... This was not a question. This wasn't a, yeah, I'll opt for that. Oh, yeah, that was kind of nice. This was an imperative, and, and he said it as boldly as he could. And it was basically this. If you are my follower, if you are following me, he's okay. He's just upset. It's okay. <laughs> he's learning how to be a preacher. You see, it's okay. It's okay. He got it. <laughs> I love that kid. He is awesome. <laughs> Sometimes he just looks, never mind. <laughs> what is he saying? You got to be like him. You getting it? That's what he's telling. If you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of God, you have to be a servant. And he's saying this, if you are not serving, you are not following. Is that clear? He's talking to the 12, and he's basically saying to them, if you aren't doing this now that you know, what it means to follow me and do it. If you don't, you know what it means? You might have all kinds of other things. It means you're not saved. Some people are getting all upset. Are you saying you got to work for your salvation? Never that. Salvation is by God's grace alone. But he's saying if you are my true follower, then you will serve. <laughs> it's so clear. And, he's, and, I, and I think the reason why he's emphasizing it is two things. One, he likes the humble. He is the God of the humble. I get that. 
But let me tell you what, what, the reason. Because he understands I'm leaving you for a mission. You want to know what it was? I could take you to heaven right now and you could be in eternal glory right now. But I have left you for a reason. What is it? Jesus? To reach a lost and dying world. To reach those that are unconnected and all alone. And if you are going to do that, if you're going to reach out to these people, you know how you're going to do it? Because you're way up here, benefactor. No. Break that mindset. Stop that thought. You're going to do it because you serve them. Before you spread the gospel, you have to be a servant. You're going to have to earn the right to share this great news that I'm about to give you. It's a fact. And it's all over his teachings. If you start looking at the New Testament, you will see it over and over and over. He's going, no, 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 don't just say a bunch of words. In fact, his brother James said it clear as could be. If you think I'm being direct, let me tell you how James puts it. Here's what James said. You can go back and read it. James said this, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Is that clear enough? He's saying if you don't have action, you don't even have it. You don't have faith if it's not accompanied by action. Because faith without works, faith without deeds is dead. That's not my words. Go back and read the book of James. It is littered throughout it. And you want to know where, you know what he's talking, you know who he's talking to? He's talking to the church. And what he's telling them is, is he's going, some of you guys, he goes, if you go out and you see these people that are hungry and thirsty and need clothes and not well off, And you tell them the gospel message, keep warm and well-fed. Now, let me tell you about Jesus. He's going, you got it wrong. You you got the sequence wrong. Meet their need. And they'll go, why did you do that? Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about your ultimate need. You can't get to that while they're still struggling with these other things. You've got to do it. Faith by itself is not. You see, if I were to summarize it, let me put it in some of our vernacular. People don't care how much you know. Until they know how much you care. You get it? Isn't that right? It's true for you, isn't it? You, you need their message, but it's like that person that comes along and meets that need. You're so more apt to, to go, okay, what do you got? Why are you doing that? Why are you here when no one else is? Why do you care about me? Well, let me tell you why. You see? Earning the right. People don't care how much you know. And I really believe that is at the crux and at the heart of what this message is all about. You see, when, as I was looking at this, I had a plan for this message. This is how I know I don't get it sometimes either. I had a plan for this message. Oh, it's washing the feet. You know, you just have a kind of a synopsis and you're going, okay, this is great. It's about service. So I had a plan for today and it was, let me tell you all the events that are coming up. And we're excited. We're excited about the events that are coming up. We have, after the fall festival, and if you're not, if you, I'd like to invite you to that awesome time. We're going to have a great fun time. And then we're going to shift gears in November and December. We're going to start serving. We're going to, we're going to help with uh, First Baptist Church in Suffolk doing a great fundraiser for, or in, in, in a dinner for, for some people that don't have enough food and some gifts and all these kinds of things. We're excited. We'll tell you about that. And we're going to be giving away some food baskets with uh, Impact Suffolk. We're excited about that. Uh, we're, we're gonna we're gonna and we're gonna help Isle of Wight Christian Outreach and help raise some money for them and do some things and, and they feed just tons of people and thousands of people is exciting and, and how they're impacting this area and, and we're excited about that and that's what I wanted to tell you about today and, and we need volunteers here at New Branch so this is the perfect opportunity to guilt trip you into going hey sign up help us <laughs> huh yeah Jesus you put this message in great good let's do it but you know as I looked at this verse and as I studied this verse and as I thought about this verse. What I'm about to say may seem like dots that don't connect, and I get that, and I just want to point that out. Because if we're not careful, you're not going to see how these connect, but they connect huge. And it's going, there's something that comes before the service. The service is important, but why you do it is just as important. And that's what Jesus was teaching here. He's going, wait a minute, motive, why do you do it, guys? Did you see what I just did? Did you see that I did this? This wasn't a public display. That's why it doesn't have the same effect if we get up here and go, let me wash your feet in front of everybody. You get it? Stop that stuff, guys. Nobody saw me do this. We're in a room, just the 12 of us. Nobody saw this. I'm teaching you something. It's it's an attitude. In the book of Philippians, chapter 2, I believe. I didn't write it down, but 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 I've been looking at this verse. I think it's Philippians, chapter 2. And You know what it says? It says, you have to have the same mind that is in Christ Jesus. 
right before that it says, do nothing out of vain ambition. I love that word. Out of yourself. Don't do it out of self. Don't do it for yourself. Don't do it out of vain ambition. But do it because you have the same mind as Christ Jesus. His attitude is what he's talking about. So before we get to where to serve and how to sign up, and all that's important, and we need to wash some feet, but, but it's a humble mindset. You get it? Because it's a lot different when you got to, just like Jesus did, you take off the outer cloak. You see what he did? And he put on his apron. That's not really popular, Jesus. <laughs> That's not look at me. That's not Facebook, Facebook worthy there. Nobody wants to see you wash feet. Yeah, I know. But we've got to change our attitude. And, and this message could even go in a worse direction, which is, you know, in fact, in fact, I probably preach messages like that. Don't build a platform for yourself. You know, don't build a platform. Don't have a platform. If we're really humble, you know what it means? We don't have a platform. That's wrong thought. It sounds right, doesn't it? I want to be humble, so I'm just not going to let anybody know what I'm doing. I'm just not going to do any of these things. We're not going to organize people to do these things. That, that almost sounds right in a way, doesn't it? I'm standing on a platform, so this is a little hard for me to say. <laughs> Why? Because my platform, I, I can speak out. I, I, got, I, got, I got my voice is being amplified, and, and some people go, Why do you need that? Because we can all hear you in here, whether you have this thing on or not. But the people that are listening online can't, right? So, so, so is it okay to do that? Oh, oh, I see. It's just about you building a platform, right? Yeah, it is. And now I don't mind saying it. Yeah, it, this is about building a platform. But the question isn't whether you should build a platform, because let me tell you about platforms. If you don't have a platform, you don't, your message doesn't get out, does it? And our job is to spread the gospel. You better have a platform. But the question is, is what are you using your platform for? What, who are you building the platform for? You? Having your moment? Or God? The kingdom of God. That's a question that's gut-wrenching, isn't it? And we got to ask ourselves, what are we building our platform for? Who are we promoting, us or God? Where will we use this influence? No better person that I've heard speak to this than John Maxwell. Um, I heard a recent conference. John Maxwell now is in his 60s. <laughs> and, and, and he's not one of the keynote speakers a lot of times now at some of the mainer conferences because he's getting older. But they had him come to Catalyst. And, and some of you might not know what Catalyst is, but I'm going to explain what it was. John Maxwell, a number of years ago, decided to start a, a leadership conference called Catalyst. And some of you may have heard of it. It's in Atlanta, Georgia. And now it's a huge conference. They actually do it four places now all over the country. At first it was just in Atlanta at a, at a main church in Atlanta. And now they meet in super domes packed full of young leaders. And he said, I see a problem with, with something. There's a disconnect between my generation and the one that's coming after me. And he said, and, he said, and the problem is, is that we're, we're all getting older. And he wasn't that old then. And he, was, and he was at his prime where, where it was like he was the man. You know, he was like he, when he came to conferences, he'd pack them out. And he had a following. But he said, I'm not interested in you guys right now. I'm interested in the ones that are younger. And so he made a conference, and, and, and he said, the only people that can come are 40 years old or younger. you got to be under 40 to come to this conference. And that alienated all his people. Now, he exempted himself, of course, <laughs> for a minute. Not long, though. And what he did was, is he said, I am going to start to give platforms and start to give recognition and start to have a movement that is going to lead to being a catalyst for those that are younger. Why is this important? Can I tell you why? Because some of you don't know, but this is what launched Andy Stanley into national recognition. Um, why is that important? Because John Maxwell very quickly moved himself out of the role. And Andy Stanley took over Catalyst, and it got bigger than any of them could ever imagine. And when he came to this conference, he was just like, this is bigger than I ever thought. <laughs> it was bigger than I ever dreamed. And most of them, they had to introduce John Maxwell to say, who is he? They didn't know. It did nothing for John Maxwell. It didn't. He had a crowd. But this wasn't his crowd. And it still wasn't his crowd, even after he started it. Why am I saying that? 
And, and, he, and he had an opportunity to speak into the lives of the people. They brought him there, and, they, and Andy was like, could you, could you just speak over this people? And he didn't speak very long. And he said, he said yeah, he goes, he goes, talk to our generation because they want it now. They want it fast, and, 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 and there's the ability now to have superstardom overnight. You know what I mean? There is. There is the ability now with social media that we have to not be known one day and have a billion hits on your YouTube overnight. You know some people that were never recognized before can be recognized now. And he said, let me, let me speak to that just for a minute. And I thought it was so wise. He said, you can be known instantly. That's true. You can have a moment. You, you can have your X factor moment. You get it? But the moment will come and go. He said, but the question is, is it, what is your goal? Is your goal to have a moment or to leave a legacy? This is a question for all of us, not just young. Is your, is your goal to have a moment or to leave a legacy? Because I'm afraid you're not probably going to be able to do both. <laughs> and my challenge to you comes out of this today. And I believe this all has to do with our attitude. If we want to wash feet the way Jesus did, it's got to start with our attitude having the same attitude as Christ Jesus. Otherwise, we're going to do a lot of great things, and it's going to look like we're doing it, but we're not. We don't get it. You get it? Here we go. My challenge for you, those of you, I'm going to challenge two sets of people, those that are under 40 <laughs> and those that are over 40, okay? <laughs> You'll have to sort out who you are, okay? <laughs> for those that are under 40, here's, what I, here's, here's where I think you got to work on the attitude. You want to know what it is? Embrace the process. This, this get there overnight doesn't work. Trust me. You're going to have a moment and it fleets away. And not only that, but, but there is all kinds of ways to build platforms bigger than other people that come before you. And we're not trying to hold you back when we say that. But let me tell you what kind of voices that we're hearing. It's my party. I can do what I want to. You heard it? It's my mouth. I can say what I want to. You get it? <laughs> And we look like idiots, don't we? Huh? We build a platform and a billion people. I've watched that, I've watched that video. And, and, and a billion people have heard. That's a song. Maybe you didn't know that. And people watch it. And millions of people, millions of people, I mean millions of people have watched this. That's a platform. But what is it saying? You have a moment and now you're gone. And you look like an idiot. And I tell you, and, and you go, what does that got to do with the church? Everything. <laughs> Because we do the same thing. We build these platforms, and we're so great, and we're so hip, and, and in 10 years, you're not. Okay? But will you leave a legacy? And the answer to that is, is will you submit to a process? Because some people want the end result, but they don't want to do the work that it takes to get there. I'm telling you. And God is looking for people. If you want to know how, what his thing is, if you want to know what he's looking for, if you want to know what it is for him, he's going, will you be faithful in the small things I've already given you? If you're faithful in the small things, I'll make you master over many. And I understand there's all kinds of shortcuts we can take. And people want to be promoted right away. And people want a voice right away. And to push somebody else's wheel is very difficult, isn't it? I want my own wheel. And I understand sometimes you've got to go out and do your own because they're holding you back and they don't get it. And it's true. But be careful with that. Submit to the process. Otherwise, you know what you're going to be like? Me and Marie went to a restaurant recently. And you know what they did? We went, and the ice cream was great. And then they, we ordered a hot dog, and they put the hot, pulled the hot dog out, and they stuck it in the microwave. Not so great. <laughs> it was rubbery. It was terrible. Have you ever had microwave food? Just not very great. And then we've been to a place recently where we went to somebody's house, and they slow cooked a pig. Have you ever been there? <laughs> okay? All day, all day. And it took forever to get this thing just perfect. You know what I mean? Crock pot. You get a different microwave crock pot. Can I tell you what you need? We got to crock pot you. <laughs> Not microwave you. Because if you microwave them, you know what they're going to turn out like? A Pop Tart. Mm -hmm. You can look that up. It's true. That's what we see. We see a bunch of Pop Tarts running around. And in the Christian world, it's no different. They turn into Pop Tarts and they go, what? It's just, there's no substance there. It's all fluff. And you're going, you got. To not do that, be micro, be, submit to the process. Be, let, it, let it, you know, let yourself simmer a little. <laughs> let yourself marinate a little. You get it? Submit to the process. It'll be the hardest thing you've ever done. But that's my challenge for you. That's having the same mindset as Christ Jesus. It really is. That's for the people under 40. The people over 40, you didn't think I was going to come for you, but I am. I'll let you determine which one I am. <laughs> Some of you have had a moment. 
You have. Some of you haven't. Maybe you relate more to, the, to what I just said before. It's not, a, it's not an age thing. It's, it's, it's where you're at thing. That's okay. But some of you have had a moment. Some of you have had a moment, and now you're the person everybody's looking up to. You've had a successful business, and now people are looking up to you. You've had a successful ministry, and people are looking up to you. And you've had a moment. And my challenge to you today is this. Stop holding on to the moment. This is going to be hard. Because what got you here won't get you there. Oh, it'll get you there. This is the problem. The problem with my statement is this. Yeah, hold on to what you got, and you, you'll be able to keep it. It's a fact. Hold on to what you got, and you'll be able to keep it. But my challenge to you is stop doing that. Stop holding on to your moment. You're going to have to let go of that to do this, to use your influence for those that come after you. And I understand what I'm asking. You see, you might be saying, well, how does that got to do with washing feet? Everything. Because it's the mindset of this. If you hold on to what you got, in fact, John Max will put it this way. I love what he said. In fact, you might need to write it down. He said, you can keep what you start. This is true. If you've started a business, you started a thing, your reputation, you can keep what you start. But if you keep it and don't give it away, it won't be much when you end. <laughs> it will in your lifetime. That's right. Oh, you'll go down and people will sing your praises and then you'll be forgotten. And it won't pass on. And you've left nothing. You took it all. You get it? So the question is, is the platform for you or building the kingdom of God? And now is the time to ask that question. Because you have influence and you can use that influence for you or you can use it for those that are coming after you. And let me tell you something, though. Are you willing to risk it? Because what I'm asking you to do and what I'm asking me to do, I'm going to tell you where it's going, is it won't do much for you but it will do an amazing work for the kingdom of God. So now's the time to ask, you ready to wash some feet? Because let me tell you about working with people that are younger. Have you done it? They're bullheaded. Huh? They know it all. They think they already know what to do, and they don't want to work with you. And maybe you've already got that attitude in you to go, I already know what they're going to be like, so now nah, I don't want any of that. Yeah, I ain't going to bother with them. I'm not even going to mess with them. I'll just do my own thing, and that's fine. Just let them figure it out, like I did. You can do that. Or you can choose to do the harder thing, <laughs> which is invest in people. Who will you invest in? Whose feet will you wash? This is what he's teaching. Jesus got it, because he goes, guys, you don't get it. <laughs> but he believed in them. And they did, and they changed the world, didn't they? They got to lead the greatest movement. So let me ask you a question today. Let me challenge you today. Will you serve? If you're a Christ follower today, will you serve? And when I say serve, will you do what he's talking about here? If you're younger, will you embrace the process this week? Will you start plugging into what's already there? Not dreaming about what could be. That's all fine. There's nothing wrong with having dreams. The problem is, is nobody wants to take the stepping stones to get to the dream. You get it? They want the dream. And they think the X factor is the way to go. I don't have to do all the work that all these other artists did to get there. I want my one shot. And half of them, you know what they do? They do find some, by the way. Some people get it. But one out of a million. Can I tell you? If you're willing to do this, you can have it. And God isn't like Simon Cowell. He's not tossing you aside and saying, you ain't got it. Go away. He's going, come, learn how to do it, and I'll put some people in your life to do it. So will you do it? Will you start serving right where you are? Not too little. Not, not looking. Here's how you can tell if you have a problem. When somebody asks you to do something and you go, yeah, I don't do that. You don't wash feet. You know, you know I find that in a nursing home, a lot of people. I want to preach, okay? Would you come preach at a nursing home this Sunday? Oh, yeah, no, I don't do that. Oh, I see. You're too good. <laughs> I want to minister to hurting, broken people. Oh, this is good. I, I, you know what I want? I want to be about that. So will you come to the nursing home and help? Literally wash some feet? Yeah, that won't do much for me. No, it won't. No, no one will hear your messages at the nursing home but them. They might not even. By the way, when you get up and preach, they don't hear them either. Does that help? <laughs> They don't hear what you said. They know how they felt. It's true. They, they don't, let, me, let me ask you a question. Last Sunday, what was the three points? 
What was it about, right? I mean, it's so fast how fast it goes. You're building a platform for nothing if that's what you think. But it's touching the heart. And if you want it, go after it. But my point is this. Who will you serve this week? Where will you start? Will you start serving right where you are? Maybe you don't know how to get there. Let me, let me, let me throw something out to you. we got two classes coming up. One, one this, this week, members class. If you want to plug into the church, do that. Here's the other one, the ministry class. Maybe you don't know where you're gifted. Let us help you with that. Let us help you with that. Sign up for it. We're going to start that on the 29th. It'll be an incredible class. Also, be here for the next series. We're starting next Sunday. We're going to have a series on Joseph. If you want to be a success, there's two people I'd like you to, to, to study. There's two people to study. If you want to be an, a, a great leader, not just a good leader, there's two people worth studying. One is Joseph and the other one is Daniel. Both were the second in command in the entire world. Not just in a country, in the entire known world. God used them in that way, and you better believe it took a process. Champions are built in the process, not the event. That's leadership, guys. You want to be a leader? You want to, you want, you want to have everything God wants? You want to have that moment? You want to have it? Then embrace the process because champions are built in a process, not in an event. The event is what leads to the process. I get it. you got to have a moment where you, you surrender. And what I find with most younger people is here's where the problem is. you got lots of passion, but when the passion fizzles, there's nothing left. There's no substance. Have some substance. Embrace the process. For the older people, here's what I'm going to ask you. How will you invest this week? How will you start the process of investing in others? Who will you meet with? Who do you need to have coffee with this week? Who do you need to call up and go, yeah, I kind of gave up on that guy? Who do you need to text right now? I'm getting real. Because tomorrow will never come. You know what I'm saying? I'll get around to it when I have time. No, you won't. You'll never have time. You'll never be less busy than you are right now. Well, I'll get there when I'm less busy. Yeah, when? You'll be irrelevant. You won't have a mind left. You'll be sitting somewhere, and they won't, you won't even know who you are, and you never let it out what God gave you. Will you invest in someone else? And who is that going to be? And some of us will have to work towards that because the mentoring process is difficult. Let me tell you guys, it will be the hardest thing you ever do. And some of us, before we can be a mentor, we have to be approachable because you're going, no, well, anybody talk to me. Yeah, there's a reason for that. You're not approachable. You're going to have to make yourself approachable, and it's worth it. Am I saying let them walk all over you? Of course not. Am I saying just tolerate any acts that they do? No, that's how you hone them. And yes, there's tough love. And yes, you know, one out of ten ain't going to make it. But that one that does, trust me, will impact the world. Are you willing to invest? And if you are, how will you start that this week? (laughs) Whose feet will you wash? Whose feet will you wash? So let me ask you a question today. Do you got it? Do you got what Jesus is talking about? Let me tell you how you can know if you do. We're going we're to wrap this up. A lot of people wonder what it's like going to be in the end of time. I can't tell you the amount of people that want to get with me and talk about Revelation and all the end time stuff and all this stuff. It's all confusing to them. And I think it was meant to be. Because there was one thing that sprung out from the whole thing. When they asked Jesus, what will it be like at the end? He told them. And it's not found in in Revelation. It's found in Matthew chapter 25. (laughs) You want to know what it's like in the end? You want to know what he's going to be like when he sits in the judge's chair and you stand before him and he says, do you got it? Let me tell you what he's going to ask. Let me tell you what it's going to be like. Matthew chapter 25, he he, he describes it. In fact, he even says that. He says, this is what it will be like at the end. That's his words. At the end of time, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and he sits on his throne with his angels all around him. That's apocalyptic, isn't it? (laughs) When I sit on my throne in heavenly glory, let me tell you what I'm looking for. He will look to the righteous, and he will say, come into the Father's kingdom. Because when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you invited me in. When I needed clothes, you clothed me. When I was... In prison, maybe you never saw that part, it's there. When I was in prison, you came to visit me. When I was sick, you came to, you you took care of me. And the righteous will say this, 
When did we see you hungry? When did we see you thirsty? You know what he says? As much as you've done to the least of these brothers of mine, you've done to me. Huh. That's the end. You know what else he said? This is hard. He turned to the unrighteous and he said, depart from me. And they were like, when did we see you hungry? When didn't we help you? And he said, as much as you haven't done to the least of these, you haven't done unto me. And he took it a step further and said, throw them out where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. These are not my words. These are his. I wouldn't. That's harsh. What are you saying? Are you saying that salvation isn't by grace, Jesus? No. But he's saying this. If you have been transformed by my grace, then you'll have it. And he's saying this. If you don't get this, you probably have never experienced me. So let me ask you a question. Do you have it? (laughs) And then I'd like you to imagine with me just for a moment something else what if we became a church like that what what if what if what if we became a church that built platforms that were about that do we have it that's the question isn't it it's hard isn't it we got to keep asking ourselves that question do we have it? Because you can have it and lose it. You can not lose your salvation. You can lose serving God in that way for the right reasons, for the right attitude, for the right thing. What if we did that? What would it be like? What do you think God could do with a church like that? Hmm? Let's stand for prayer. Father, we come before you today. And Lord, I I pray this morning for the person that came here today and they don't know you. They're struggling and they're going, I don't know you. (laughs) I want to. And they're they're lost and they're broken and they're unconnected and all alone. And I pray today, Lord, break through that. Help them to see that you sent your one and only son to come and die for their sins. His his broken body and shed blood for the complete remission of their sins. That, That he rose again to prove that he's God and he has the power to do that. And he wants to restore a relationship with them. And if they're here today, God, I pray they call out to you. And they find you today because you're already reaching out to them. They need help. Lord, help us to help them. Then I pray for us that have said that we're following you. And as we examine ourselves today, Lord, what is it we're doing? Are we building platforms for ourselves? Are we disguising it by saying it's for you? I pray for the young person, Lord, that's struggling today because they're going, I I don't know how to get my moment. I pray today, God, that they'll opt for leaving a legacy. That's that's, 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 that's old terminology for somebody young. But I pray today, God, that you'll break their heart to realize there's such a bigger thing than just them. That they can be part of a movement that will change everything for all of eternity. I pray to God, Lord, help them to submit to that process. As they're faithful in the small things, you'll make them master over many things. I pray that, Lord, we'll be a church that helps embrace that. That, Lord, we will not be a church that sits back and, and, and just waste our, t- waste our young people. That we invest in them. That, that we send them off. And, Lord, when they start works greater than ours, we point to them and we go, to God be the glory. I don't know how he did it. I don't know how we got to be part of that. What an amazing thing that would be. Then, God, I pray for the older the ones over 40. God, I pray, Lord, my heart's desire for me, Lord, as I'm at the beginning of that stage, (laughs) is that we don't die in our beds. We die with our boots on. I don't want to die in my bed, Lord. I want to die in the battle. (laughs) I pray that over each one of them, but I pray while we're doing that, Lord, help us not just to have our moment, but help us to invest in those that are coming. Help us to wash some feet, Lord. That as we leave, the planet is better off because of us and no one will ever know it was us because it really wasn't. It was you. (laughs) God, make us that kind of church. Now, Lord, as we change our focus right now, God, and we change our focus to this, as we baptize today, Lord, what better Sunday could that be? (laughs) As we get into this pool today, Lord, this man that's coming, 
I pray to gay God that you um you help us to celebrate that. Not because of us, not celebrating New Branch, not celebrating that, but because the Lord added to our numbers someone that got saved. <laughs> what how blessed is that, Lord? That we get to be part of that. Isn't that something? Thank you, God. You receive all the honor and the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm going to like to dismiss um, Jimmy. You're getting baptized, so if you want to go change, you can. And um, I'll be joining you in just a second.